Hello, very good evening and a big welcome to everyone who's joined in. This is the last session of the day and we're going to be discussing Project Pegasus, as my colleague told you. Uh, this is arguably the biggest story of the year, a landmark set of revelations uh, spanning different countries, many news organizations, including our very own The Wire in India. Uh, the story briefly, uh, these stories, in fact, briefly revealed uh, how journalists, dissenters, and even politicians were potential targets of a spyware uh, developed by Israeli surveillance company NSO. And for the first time, I think we were able to put a face to victims or potential victims of this massive global spy tech industrial mammoth complex. Uh, thank you, Michael, Kabir, Sanzine, and Julian for joining us. And in the spirit of this excellent, wonderful, collaborative project that you guys put together, I'd love for this panel to also be as collaborative. So please feel free to jump in with your comments, with whatever you want to say. Don't want to keep it very formal, um, keep it conversational. And um, I want to start with Sandy. So uh, of course, all of us want to know how you got the story, but you can't tell us that because you need to protect your thoughts. But why don't you take us through the initial days of when Forbidden Stories was first confronted with this massive, massive data leak. I'm guessing list full of numbers. How did you begin to even make sense of what was in front of you? So just take us through the initial days of discovering this big leak. Yes, of course. Thank you very much for that invitation. So Forbidden Story is a nonprofit affairs based organization. And our first mission is to pursue the work of journalists uh, who are silenced either because they're threatened or arrested or killed. And so we've been working on uh, threatens against journalists uh, for a while. And we discovered that many of the journalists um, we, we were interested in were basically uh, targets of Pegasus. And that's how we started to understand that a uh, cyber weapon like Pegasus uh, was targeting journalists all across the world. And this is how we ended up uh, with this um, huge uh, leak, a uh, massive leak of 50,000 phone numbers. Uh, this is all what we had, uh, numbers all around the world. Um, numbers we knew were uh, potentially selected and for targeting, selected for targeting by uh, clients of uh, Pegasus. And, and we had uh, more than 10 countries who were um, uh, investigating. Uh, and so we started with the consortium of 16 um, media partners all around the world, including The Guardian, The Washington Post, Le Monde, uh, The Wire in India, uh, investigating that list and trying to put a face behind the numbers. So that was our first mission. Um, and how did, you, we, how did you go about choosing your uh, media partners? What was the criteria of collaborating with The Wire or say Le Monde, The Guardian? Uh, we we have we are working in consortium for uh, for four years now. So we have uh, partners we're working with for a very long time, like the Monde or the Guard or the Guardian. Uh, we immediately contacted them and 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 share what we had, and then we of course um, also chose um, our partners according to the data we had. So. Uh, we discovered that we had a lot of data in uh, in India and, and started investigating those data. We discovered the name of journalists, including journalists from The Wire. So we made sure um, to contact them in a safe way to, to try to uh, convince them to have their phone analyzed, to, to have the confirmation. And, and then we invited them to Paris as partners. So their position was of course different. They were at, uh, at the same times targets and also partners, but they understood uh, basically the uh, the stake of, of the investigation. So they were very careful in the way they were communicating with us because this was uh, really the biggest threat during the investigation. We didn't, uh, of course, we knew that our phones were our worst enemies during that uh, that period, and and so we basically had to investigate without our phones, which is a bit complicated. Uh, but we made it, and we made it in a, in a complicated period because all the countries were still um, uh, uh, going through that COVID and 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 Delta period, um, Delta COVID period. So yeah, we we made it. Um, we. We took a lot of precautions we even cannot speak of, but uh, <laughs> basically this, this 
has worked since um, everything was kept confidential until the, the day of publication, uh, the 18th. And, and so on the 18th, all the partners, the 17 partners, uh, published the same story at the same time. And this is also the uh, why we're working as consortium. I mean, we, we, need, we need human resource to investigate such data. And we know that the impact is, is much higher when we are 17 publishing and, and not one or two media in the world. Okay. It's very interesting. So you were already looking at journalists who were threatened across the world and who couldn't go about doing their work because of threats. And you, you saw that Pegasus was sort of a theme running through these threats. And that was your entry point into investigating it further, as I understand. Um, okay. And uh, one thing interesting that Sandrine brought up was a lot of the journalists who were partners were also targets. So that brings me Niki to Kabir, because in one sense, you guys are also investigating or reporting on yourselves because you were also victims. Uh, many of the, I think four journalists, at least from the wire were on the list and one columnist, if I'm not yeah. so, uh, how does that work reporting how do you maintain a sense of balance or a sense of a distance when you are part of the story yeah i mean i think i don't think it was difficult from the very beginning because we made a very clear distinction uh, and the story for us was always outside of the wire newsroom <clears throat> so because we were not uh, we were not looking at our reporters or <clears throat> our editors who've been targeted as the story <clears throat> we were always looking for stories outside so we knew we had the phones analyzed in the early period. So for us, like mentally, it was done and dusted. So it, it, the, the precautions that we needed to take, we needed to be very careful because it was uh, entirely possible that some of those phones were still being, uh, were, still, were still infected with Pegasus. So we had to be very, very careful of never having the phone in the room when we were having a conversation. So that is something that we did all the time. And how many people in the wire knew about uh, the investigation? Like, was there a, how um, do you keep it a secret in such a small newsroom? It was initially, initially just, initially just three people who knew about it. Uh, then we got more people on board, but in total, we were a team of six who were investigating it by the end of it. Um, and I mean, only six people who were working on it because the risk of course was that uh, it might leak. The more people we tell the chances of information leaking out were uh, was there but it would increase so we made sure that we had a small team uh, which also meant that there was a lot of uh, work to be done by the six people who were working on it uh, but it never i mean the wire is in, in the best of times a very small newsroom and this was even even smaller part of the wire which was investigating such a massive thing which uh, uh, something like this uh, i mean uh, the wire has also not worked on anything like this in the past. Most of us have never worked on anything like this in the past. So it was a new experience for all of us, but what helped immensely was just having the 17 media organizations and people who, who had worked and who've been veterans of doing the, these kind of investigations. So having access to them really, really helped a lot. So we never felt that we were on our own uh, investigating something that, uh, we probably like individually, we would not be able to, uh, but we, since we had access to, and we could speak to everyone uh, every day almost. And we had uh, weekly meetings, uh, India meetings, they were called and uh, <clears throat> where we would see Michael, Julia and the others who were reporting on India. And so that helped a lot uh, in, in just keeping a sense of what, what is to be done. What, I mean, what are the steps to be followed? Because it's, uh, investigations on, on screen look very glamorous, but they are not. In reality, when you're actually doing them, they are a set of repetitive steps that you have to take with different people. Uh, so just that. Uh, but we also got uh, other people involved within the wire who we did not uh, who we did not tell the full story to. So we needed some uh, someone in Kashmir, for example, someone in Punjab. So we did get other people to do bits of reporting, but we would give them the minimal information that they needed to do that bit of reporting. Uh, so that is how we managed, uh, we managed to pull it all together by the end of it. We were, of course, like uh, all of us, I think everyone here would agree that we were operating at a different pace to all of them, uh, but we came together <laughs> in the end. <laughs> and there were some frustrations with that too, uh, in the beginning during the process, but uh, it, it came together in the end, uh, thankfully. 
we want to know more about the frustrations but i want to come to you <laughs> michael um, would be best place to <laughs> <laughs> michael you are you're on mute you have to unmute yourself and Actually, then express your frustration you, you know my, <laughs> michael did the uh, michael did a uh, fantastic podcast about hmm. how uh, we worked all together and actually in your podcast i remember you start the, the, the podcast by describing how those journalists came from all over the world to paris and and paris is uh, is quiet and empty because it's during the lockdown yeah. and we all met at uh, at le monde auditorium I, mean, i think they were like maybe 40 or 50 journalists and i think that none of us would know exactly what it was about it's just that You know, when we entered the auditorium and we had to leave the, the smartphones, I remember in a in big uh, black suitcase. So we had to enter the auditorium without uh, smartphones to, to discuss uh, the project. So it was quite, uh, it was quite interesting. Sounds very exciting. So I think a lot of uh, our viewers will also want to know how did this collaboration occur? You know, these multiple journalists from across the world. What was like your day-to-day -day communication like? What was the day-to-day -day procedures like? Um, And how were you securing your information, like in terms of text? Do you want to take that, Julian? Yeah, just I mean, you know, for Le Monde, there was a so there was a I think for all of us there was a newspaper team and a country team. So, for example, at Le Monde, uh, five journalists uh, were covering the uh, the issue. So there were two journalists uh, looking after the data privacy issues. And uh, three other journalists covering uh, different regions. So uh, I was mostly, you know, I was taking care of India. Somebody else was taking care of Middle East and Africa. So at Le Monde, we would meet uh, once a week. And uh, initially, it was just the five of us. Uh, there was no uh, uh, photo editor, graphic designer, no copy editor. So it was a very small uh, meetings. And uh, every week, we had also um, a meeting with the. Uh, the India team, so uh, Michael, Kabir, and uh, all of them. And that would happen how? Like, what would you use uh, to secure and the media? In, in, a, in a secure way. <laughs> okay, you know what? This is... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit frustrating, but uh, of course, we had to set up a very, very uh, strict uh, security protocol because we knew, I mean, we knew we had a list every Intel service in the world would want to have. We knew that uh, we might be potentially targeted at any moment and, and, and some of us were already targeted, their phone were compromised. So, I mean, this is such sensitive data. It's nothing we can say and, and we'll never be able to say how we have been working during that time. But believe me, it's uh, probably the most... Uh, secure uh, security, most secure protocol um, a consortium of journalists has set up for a, a collaborative investigation. Because we were not only investigating NSO, which has created the uh, most invisible and invasive spyware in the world, we were also investigating governments that are not the most democratic uh, or the nicest government in the world. Uh, I mean, we're speaking of governments who, who can kill journalists and, and, and cut them off in, in, in consulate. So, We were extremely, extremely, all of us, and the eight journalists were remarkably uh, um, strict about um, using the protocol we, we had set up and never, never do otherwise. Okay. I'm not getting much out of you in terms of details, but <laughs> okay. Uh, Michael, do you want to uh, elaborate on your frustrations or should I just get to my question? <laughs> Absolutely no frustrations whatsoever. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, we would have weekly meetings as in terms of the Guardian team. Um, hmm. And, and uh, our investigations editor at one point was saying to me, you know, we're, we're not getting a lot out of India. Like, like, when is that coming? I said to him, I said to him, India is going to be the best story that comes out of this whole investigation. You know, it's going to be the one that stands above all the others, but it's all going to happen in the last week. <laughs> so, so we, we, we need to be prepared for that. Um, and no, and but genuinely, I mean, The Wire did extraordinary, extraordinary work. I mean, the things that, that we were able to publish about what was happening in India, um, mm. virtually unparalleled in any country. And, you know, that was 95% down, down to the kind of hard work and, and just like, just the kind of clever way in which um, The Wire operated. So, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was worth it in the end, definitely. Great. 
Now, you've made a fantastic series of podcasts, which I highly recommend everyone should listen to if they haven't. Um, I want to ask you, how did you, there's just so much information that you got through this leak. And there's just so much data. How did you make sense of it and pass through it to distill it into those five episodes? What was your methodology to do that? How did you? Yeah. Um, God, it was um, it was difficult because there's obviously so much to to cover. Um, you know, but but actually, like it came very naturally because I guess I thought if I was to try to explain this story to somebody, what would you emphasize? Um, and I think it was important for us to. Look, we knew ultimately we were talking to a British audience, um, mm. and so that that helped to guide us. But then also, we knew we couldn't be exhaustive. Like, like this is such a broad project; it ends up being dozens of stories. We cannot do that justice. So it was more about like, how do we just tell a kind of, how do we just tell a, a great story out of what we have? And to me, it was really important that each episode had like a different feel to it. So the first episode is like a kind of almost like a kind of spy film it has that that feeling of you know paris and it's it's deserted and it's a bit dystopic and you know you're being led into an office and putting your phone in a, in a suitcase and then someone's opening up you know a screen and you're seeing numbers trickling down the page and it just i mean it, it kind of it, it tells itself um but then the second episode we wanted to sort of tell the story of of nso and these attempts to try to to track what they were doing um and you know, we were speaking to a guy from a group called Citizen Lab, and he was telling us about how he had an agent from um, an Israeli organization called Black Cube come to to try to um, speak to him, to try to find out what he was looking into. And he looked into, um, he was looking into wow. NSO, among other things. Um, and, you know, he talked about how this guy was like clearly a fake agent, how he had a, he had a camera in his pen and he was sort of awkwardly putting the camera in the face of, of this guy and, we just felt like that that's really funny right so like that episode could be a little bit a little bit more lighthearted and funny and then the, the the episode in mexico you know if you listen even the music has a kind of slightly like you know mexican guitar style yeah, feel yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know we just try to we thought it was important that we can't just list things for people right but you know we're talking about a story that spans the whole world it has so many elements to it. So it was about trying to make every episode as diverse as possible. So just people kind of find every part of it interesting. Um, actually, it, was, it wasn't that hard, only because the story is just so good. Like, like we, we were working on something that was so interesting that our question was just how do we, how do we, how do we kind of do it justice, basically? And how long did it take for you guys to produce the podcast? A, a, fright, a frighteningly small amount of time it was like it was far too little time basically um we started working on it pretty much a week and a half before the july 18 um the the, the, the first story went up um oh, okay. yeah okay. yeah it we, literally we did it in about um how many days is that like 12 days or something um it was it was complete craziness. We just didn't like I I didn't sleep for days. I, I mean, thought you'd get I, like six months at the Guardian to do something like no, this. No, my God, no, 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 <laughs> not at all. But I mean, look, I was working with a huge team. I mean, it was the first thing I did with our podcast team, um, and they are extraordinarily talented people, um, and and they were the ones who did just so much of the work. So it was it was a kind of a team of about on the podcast alone, a team of about five or six people. Um, working basically nonstop in like a little room in the Guardian um, where like with everything else we did for this project, it had to be cut off from everyone else, phones outside, couldn't tell anyone else at the Guardian what we were doing. Um, the, we had to kind of keep the door closed. We probably were spreading COVID back and forth for days and days. It was like, it was a complete, like it was a very much a sort of tiny silo that we made. Um, and we worked, we just worked really hard, but everyone was working really hard. I mean, Kabir, uh, Sandrine, Julian, everyone, I, I think, was just working their butts off, basically, for in those last few weeks. Okay. Now, um, I want to I wanna ask this question to each of you, actually, so just, you know, weigh in with whatever you think. Um, with the story, the kind of secrecy you had to maintain with what exactly the list was. And, you know, NSO then said that, okay, we've got nothing to do with this list. We don't even have such numbers. We don't even have access to our clients' data. They basically rubbished it. And uh, there had to be essentially a secrecy maintained around your source, around where this list came from, what exactly it is. Uh, did you, how tough was it? I guess not how tough was it, but 
did you see this as a hindrance in building trust with your audience because you cannot come you know come out clearly with what exactly you have or the methods through which you got it uh, did you see this as a um, hindrance in building trust with your reader and how do you sort of surmount that and because this is also something that your critics have used against you i know that in india at least a lot of pro government news channels have said that you know they don't know what they're talking about possibly maybe using words like potential you know so this is just something vague um sandrine do you want to take that did you see this as a challenge and what did you think you could do to surmount it from and what the beginning we knew to, to these yeah. questions uh, no from from the beginning we knew that this would not be a data uh, a data project i mean this was not the, the aim our aim was not to publish the list of people but to do uh, an investigative work and all what we did all the work we did before publishing our stories was basically about fact checking checking verifying the numbers so this is why it took us a long time to try to get in touch with the targets who are seeing in our list convince them to uh, have their phone analyzed and whenever we did that the, the phone came back with traces of pegasus when um, when it was a phone used at the time of of the targeting so this made us very sure of what we were publishing and we were of course cross checking the data with every public information we had about uh, pegasus attacks either citizen lab reports or whatsapp leak or the, the public targets of whatsapp in india were all appearing in our list for example so there was no doubt we had no doubt about what we were seeing but this of course was not for us enough to publish we we publish our stories with all the fact checking the evidence we had found all along the way and today um you you have the french government uh, and authorities confirming that uh five minister um were basically um targeted and they found uh, traces of pegasus uh same thing in in belgium where you have authorities confirming that the targets we have identified basically were um pegasus targets so it's not only about um our consortium publishing it's all today about authorities confirming what we're finding and i think in, in france it's taken very very seriously we have uh, meetings with authorities uh, of the record meetings but they all tell us that what we found was big uh, quite serious and and we know that investigations are um are today going on in many parts of the world and a lot is coming still on on pegasus hmm. do you want to take that julian i'm um, just your thoughts on how hard it was to sort of uh build a sort so, of so so your... so obviously you know i mean uh, having a list is one thing having numbers is one thing but the other thing is to to check the uh, the numbers i mean to, we did forensic for example so so we did uh, our work of journalists to check whether the, the information was accurate or not. So the other difficulty was not only to, to check uh, the, the information, it was also to, uh, to, to find a story out of those numbers. So basically, you have a list of numbers. Uh, what do you do with it? Uh, first step is you have to, to find the, the people associated with those numbers. That's one thing. It's quite difficult because we had uh, lots and lots of numbers in those lists. And uh, in that regard, uh, it was super useful to work uh, with the, the wire journalists because they had lots of contacts huh, in India. Mm -hmm. so that was <laughs> that was one thing. The other thing was to uh, find a story. So, so why uh, those people uh, were uh, possibly targeted uh, at that period of time? And so, for that, you know, there are different uh, possibilities. Uh, so, we had to see uh, at that period of time what happened. And why those people were uh, were were targeted, and sometimes the people were not uh, that famous. Uh, so so it took a lot of time also to make sense out of this uh, data, uh, and that's what it was uh, interesting. The other difficulty also is that you can't uh, call uh, the people and say you've been infected with with Pegasus uh, because <laughs> we had to keep it secret till the date of publication, uh, and. Uh, So, so that that's must have created a lot of problems because a lot of people probably were just not sure of what you were asking them or what you wanted because you had to maintain so much. So, so I think I think the 
I mean, Michael, the wire journeys, they, they found the magic formula, you know, to, to speak to people without... Uh, there was no food. formula. <laughs> so many people oh, sorry. Yelled, yelled at us. So many people yelled at us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like one of yeah. our rep- reporters was actually told that, do you want money? <laughs> like he, some, he went to somebody to tell him that your phone is possibly hacked. He said, do you want money? Like, but so many people would get, yell at us because we would call them, give them the least amount, of, very little information. We cannot tell them anything over the phone. So we would just ask them to, uh, to just join us on a secure link. And then we will be able to tell you. So, so a lot of people would not be convinced. That I, if, especially if they don't know you, uh, they would not be convinced and they would just uh, yell at us. Sometimes they would uh, uh, say no. Uh, a lot of times they would say no. So it would take a lot of uh, calls to co- just convince convince them. Uh, we cannot tell them a lot over email, over WhatsApp, over anything, anything to do with the phone. So we have to. I mean, we cannot tell them that your phone is possibly hacked via email, via WhatsApp. So there was there was that difficulty in just getting them onto that secure link where we could tell them. The next step would be to convince them to do forensic analysis, which is which was the cr- most very critical. hard. Yeah, which is and well, that for because not everyone wants to give their phone, you know, exactly. up for an examination. They're, they're not sure what amount of data, what the picture, their messages. So they are not sure exactly. about that. Uh, and and forensic analysis was the most critical part of our investigation because that is what would give us uh, that is what would give us the evidence, the proof that this data is real, and this person was actually hacked, which is a lot better than saying that this was person was potentially hacked. Uh, so that is what we needed for our investigation. So we needed to convince a sizable number of people to do those forensic analysis. And, and for us, that was what was really, really tricky. And we, till, till now, we've not been able to convince uh, a lot of people to do that. Uh, although we did manage to convince a lot of people and we did turn out uh, positive infections for a lot of people. Uh, but that process was complex. And even the process of just doing uh, the forensic analysis of up- uploading the backup of your phone uh, also took uh, a while. And not everybody in our, in our office associated with the project was particularly tech savvy or the person who's uploading the backup was not particularly tech savvy. So that, that was also a problem sometimes for us as well. So it was a steep learning curve as well because we had to learn how to do this very quickly uh, because with many of these people, we would only get one opportunity. If we mess up in that one opportunity, if somehow the backup doesn't go, they might not, uh, they might not agree to give us the phone again. Uh, so that happened a lot. Uh, and we still continue to do forensic analysis of people's phones even now. A lot of people are now coming forward as well to, uh, they're more, uh, I mean, <clears throat> they're, they're, more, they're still cautious, but uh, there is uh, there is a sense of uh, I mean they still uh, they still fear that the, the data might uh, someone else might have access to their data but this still it's better than it was uh, at that time because at that time people had very little idea of what this is about. Michael, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, just I think Kabir is absolutely right. It's it's I mean it's an exceptionally difficult thing to be called by a journalist who who you don't know um, who you don't really trust who says to you. You know, I, I have information that your phone might be. Well, you don't even hear that, right? You're told I have information to share with you about cybersecurity or something, and then I need to persuade you to get onto a, a kind of more secure channel so I can give you a, a bit more information. Um, and you know, we had to kind of be very creative with the truth. I mean, I remember there was one person. I have to be careful how I say it, but I remember there was one person I, I spoke with, and I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm Michael. I'm a journalist with the Guardian. Um, and somebody is going to contact you uh, in person in the next couple of weeks, and they're going to claim that they've been sent by uh, by by me, um, and they're going to tell you something that is going to seem unbelievable. But I, I just want to tell you that that it's true. Like, and I can't tell you what it what it is or when they're going to get in touch. But but it, but just remember that it is yes. Like I, I did ask them to speak to you basically. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'd do if I got that call. <laughs> it's a weird call, but you know, what I found more often than not is the response you get is a very solemn one because people understand that um, you don't muck around with this stuff. You know, you don't you don't call them and, and drop something like that on them unless unless you're serious. And so, 
the people, I mean, many of the people that I spoke to in this way, um, they just, they just got it. They, they got that this is something worth taking seriously. Um, and then on the other hand, as we got closer to publication and when we were finally informing people um, about the fact that they were going to be mentioned in our stories as potential hacking victims, there was the most wonderful feeling of liberation when you could just get on the phone to someone and say, we think you've been hacked using Pegasus. And it was, it was fantastic. Um, and and, and I, I, they were the conversations I really enjoyed because you just felt so free. I remember um, in the case of Imran Khan, exactly, getting the phone number of the um, information minister in Pakistan and just being able to tell him, uh, like reading a number out and saying, this number I've just read you is, is Imran Khan's number. And I know this because it's on a list. And this list is people who, you know, we think may have been hacked using this, using Pegasus. And it was just fantastic because you get to kind of finally, this stuff you've been holding in for, for months and not telling anybody, um, you, you finally get to shout it from the rooftops. It was, it was great. <laughs> so you guys have touched on how hard it was. I, 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 I must people, that, go ahead. The, yeah, yeah, I must say that people, uh, I mean, all the people uh, didn't have necessarily a positive uh, attitude. Like, I remember I, I, I talked to a few people and, and they were like uh, a bit shocked and immediately they said, but I didn't do anything wrong, you know. Uh, they felt a bit guilty uh, most of the time because uh, they worked with organizations also, so, so they were wary of the consequences. They were trying to understand what what wrong did they do, so it was not necessarily a good news uh, for those people. I mean, my problem was that, for example, I was working on the Rafale issues, so there were lots of uh, defense companies, and obviously it's uh, it's <laughs> it's very difficult to uh, uh, to convince those people to uh, to give a smartphone. But uh, well, for other people, they were a bit uh, scared and wary also. What was uh, difficult as well when when we had to announce um, basically to some of the people that their phone was probably hacked or um, at least targeted uh, was the sense of of guilt they 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 had in some cases. I remember Katija Ismailova, who who is a famous investigative journalist in Azerbaijan, who has been arrested, uh, harassed. Uh, um, we waited for her to be in Germany to tell her that her phone was in the list and to have her phone analyzed. We discovered her phone was compromised. But the first thing she, she felt was guilt because she remembered all the people she contacted through Signal, thinking that Signal was a, an encrypted and secure way of communication. And, and she felt, well, my God, I, I put those people in danger. And it's, it was very hard at some point calling all these people, seeing the... Um, the, the, the guilt they had, uh, some of them were journalists who might have put their sources in danger, others were mm. um, activists uh, in, in countries where people are arrested, where people are threatened. So this was at some point very difficult also for, for us even, I mean, humanly speaking. Mm. I think for you it must be all the more difficult in the beginning, right, Sandrine, because you guys made the initial contact with journalists to without, you know, you weren't able to tell them what exactly the story was, but you had to convince them to get them on board. Uh, how do you gain the trust of your, you know, media partners? I know that it's a consortium and you've worked with them, but still, and did you get pushback from journalists like that you were working with? Did you have a lot of questioning from them? Because, you know, these are also editorial minds, like, you know, so many editorial minds together, probably pushing back on, no, we don't think this works, or we need more information on stuff. How was that experience like in the beginning? Before you decide on, on a topic like this, before you decide to contact a partner uh, for collaboration like The Wire or Direct 36, you already know somebody who know that partner, who, have, who has been working with that partner. So basically, we, we didn't contact The Wire or Siddharth or we didn't contact Direct 36 uh, out of nowhere. We, we, we worked on, I mean, we did our homework, like trying to find out who was the best contact, how we could contact them safely. Often we were going through one journalist we already knew to contact that journalist. Uh, we usually uh, send people on the ground because um, we couldn't do that even on a secure line. Uh, for us, it was too risky at the beginning. We really didn't know what we were dealing with. 
So we find we found somebody who went to see Siddharth, uh, Siddharth uh, from The Wire at the beginning, uh, who convinced him to put his phone in a different uh, room. Uh, that person had bought a specific device for us to communicate with Siddharth. And, and so this is how we did it. And, and so it took a very long time. But hmm. at some point, one, once you, people see uh, how serious this is, and, and those people are all investigative journalists, they understand, um, they understand the stakes very quickly. Uh, they were immediately on board and, and, and they immediately accepted the, the rules we, uh, we, we had to set up. Okay, I have to take questions now in a bit, but I have two quick questions that I want uh, all of you to dwell on. Uh, guys who are watching, please put your questions at themediarumble.com slash live in the comments section. We're going to be picking up questions from there, so do that, and we'll take them in the next five minutes. Uh, we have two not-for-profit here, Forbidden Stories on the Wire, and two people from big legacy media organizations, Le Monde and Guardian. So I just want to ask, uh, let's start with the legacy guys. Um, when you're working on an investigative story, what are the problems of working in a big legacy media organization? I mean, you feel like there's some aspects uh, maybe would have been easier had you been working with a not-for-profit. What are the pulls and pressures of working with a legacy media, not just for Pegasus, but for investigative stories? Hmm. Julian, do you want to take that? Um, Yes, uh, so, so, so uh, well, it's true that we're not a non-profit organization, but uh, it doesn't mean that we, we make a lot of profits. Yeah, we're, we're in involuntarily not for profit, I think. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure the... the but it's not just about profit or not for profit, they, they, but they really, yeah, they, in they a big really organization. To, to do profits. No, so, so the importance, I, I guess, for Le Monde is not to lose money, uh, that's for sure, but... Uh, uh, the, the shareholders of Le Monde, they, they, they know that uh, Le Monde will never be uh, very profitable. No, no, but so, so I, I didn't feel any pressure. You know, at one point, uh, like, so, so for example, 10 years ago, uh, Le Monde's revenues were coming from advertising. It was like 50% advertising, 50% subscribers. Now, I think it's 80 or 90% of the Le Monde revenues that come from subscribers. That's so excellent. we can do any investigation we want if the, if the readers of Le Monde like it, uh, let's go for it. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, three months ago, I, I did a story on the uh, Total uh, company in Burma. And uh, so the Total, uh, Total CEO was very angry and uh, he canceled the uh, uh, advertising campaign with Le Monde. So we lost a lot of money. But you know, the director told me, well, at the end of the day, it's good because we, we got more readers, thanks to your stories. Uh, so, so it's pretty good, and uh, so, so I don't think I don't think Le Monde gives in, you know, a, a, any pressure. It, it doesn't exist uh, as such. Now, you know, of of course, we have to to write stories. It's difficult to spend a year on an investigation story without writing anything else. Yes, that's for sure. But, but you know, uh, so, so me, for example, on the Pegasus uh, story. Uh, for, for three months, you know, I could be dedicated uh, on, on that story and only on that story for, for three months. And so it's, uh, it's a luxury. I, I'm aware of that. Great. And I think uh, it's a very important message for all our viewers. You have to subscribe. You have to pay for news if you want news to serve public interest. So do that. Subscribe to the organizations that you think are doing good work. It's very important to support good journalism. And that's what will keep it going, not advertisers. Uh, Michael, you want to come in? And I don't mean this in a sense of just, you know, corporate pressure or... No, I understand. Profit, it's, profit, you're talking but, organizationally, you know, yeah. Yeah, maybe even organizationally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I would say it's it's sort of... You're definitely less nimble in a bigger organization. Um, you know, you, you kind of... Obviously, there's more bureaucracy. There's more people's approval you need to seek. But I think... Um, the Guardian understood that this sort of project was very much core to our mission and was a big deal. I mean, you know, it was very much in the tradition of the, the WikiLeaks disclosures, the, the, the Snowden um, revelations in 2013. Um, and I think with something of, of kind of this nature, the organization really can kind of pull in one direction. 
Um, and you know, normally the Guardian is is huge, and it's so many people doing so many different things. But especially in the weeks leading up to the publication, we would have big all of Guardian meetings. You, you might have 24 people on these calls from all the different departments. Um, and to see a big, you know, talented, powerful organization all pulling in one direction towards getting one story, you know, podcasts, visuals, sub editors, legal, everything, every part of the company um, was, it was a, a, a beautiful thing to watch. Like, like it was something that I really enjoyed because I felt like, you know, when, you know, you've got normally sort of two or three dozen spotlights and when they're all pointing in one direction, it's very, very powerful. Um, and, and it was, it was, you know, normally the, the disadvantages of being in a big organization really were swept away for something like this because, because people get it. I mean, like, what is the guardian for, if not for, for stories like this? And I think, I think people get that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, as working for the wire and a smaller organization, not for profit, what is the, the flip side of what were the issues and what is some, something you felt that, okay, if I was in a bigger organization, I could have done this better. What are the challenges for doing something like this, an investigative project for a not-for-profit, relatively smaller organization? Initially, like, I personally had doubts if uh, we would be able to do it, uh, <clears throat> if we, we had the capacity to do it. Uh, but we did uh, eventually because there was hunger as well, because uh, almost none of us had done anything of this size before and, and scope. So there was hunger. So everybody worked harder than they usually do. <clears throat> and every, everything came together in the sense of, uh, so our focus in the, from the very beginning, uh, as our editor made clear to us was that we have to identify as many people in this list as possible. So that, that was our focus uh, from the beginning. Uh, so we had to compromise on certain other things. So we were uh, focused on identifying, so this, which is why we've been able to identify more than uh, 300 people in the list. And that identification also involved several processes. So it wasn't easy. Like one layer of identification would be that you have someone's name show up on a true caller or call app. But that's not enough. You need another source of uh, confirmation for that. So we focused our energies on that which is why we were able to get so many stories as we did. I don't even know how many now. Um, but the flip side to that was that we were not able to focus uh, on one story, that we were not able to dig deep uh, into one story and tell the entirety. So there, there, are, there would be certain aspects. So, so those stories are still for the taking, like the, mm -hmm. they are still, they're there to be followed up, that what actually happened, what happened behind the scenes. There is a lot to be done there which uh, we can do uh, in the time to come or, or other media houses can, can do. So that is something that I felt, and I'm not even sure how uh, that, if that would have been different, uh, had it been a legacy or a bigger media organization or a bigger team working on this, because, mm -hmm. the, because the time we had was very short. So we had a very, almost like two or three months, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how much difference it would have made. Uh, I, I guess we'll only find out as we do more investigations which involve different <laughs> sizes and scopes. So I'm not sure, but I think that the wire, uh, given its capacity, did an extraordinary job uh, of investigating these stories. Sandrine, do you want to come in quickly uh, on uh, on forbidden stories being a not-for-profit? And I think with you, you've experienced both sides. You've also worked with like the media organizations investigating, doing some landmark investigations for them pros and cons of working with legacy while investigating and while and working with a smaller sort of a not-for-profit organization like Forbidden Stories? I mean, we don't choose our partners according to, to, to those criteria. Basically, mm -hmm. we, we, cho we choose partners who want to work with us. Uh, we choose partners who are uh, good investigative journalists who believe in what we do and at and, and this Start of our mission is, is the will to pursue the work of assassinated journalists, and this is how we create our our uh, our first partnership. So then, being a non-profit, be, being a bigger news uh, legacy, I mean, I, I think um, we also have a relation with journalists uh, personally. We we have working relation. Um, um, we we know each other. We rely on people who know good journalists. We know who know each other. So 
this is not i think um, michael or julia or kabir would have done the same uh, the same work wherever <laughs> but but uh, firstly for you as an investigative journalist do you have a preference because you work with both big me- big media and with legacy uh, sorry with legacy and with not for profit as an investigative journalist yourself do you what do you perceive are the pros and cons of the two different some some i mean we have the time at forbidden stories to do one big investigative a year which is really something that is not given to many journalists investigative journalists uh, wow. and and this is something we really appreciate this is why we come with those big projects because uh basically we don't have to publish a story every every day every week every two weeks and time is really our most precious um yeah um a uh, friend because uh, this is this makes the difference between a journalist and an investigative journalist basically it's time but um i I'm, i'm sure the garden um, give a lot of resources le monde as well love resources a lot of time in those stories because we know how impactful they are and in that specific case that was i mean there was not any difference between the partners everybody understood the um basically the impact we're going to have The forbidden story is just is one one story a year i mean one big project one, one, one big, big project because yeah our work is really to uh, initiate um, projects to lead them and to coordinate them but then we are a small team here in paris we of course we don't be able to have the same um, resources than other media like le monde the garden uh, and we believe in collaboration we believe that collaboration brings protection to journalists we believe that um everybody's um it's a, it's a win-win relationship uh, what the wire does helps uh, everybody here in paris in in london what uh, michael uh, did uh, helped a lot of people all over the world so i mean it's a win-win game i just wanted to quickly also add that <clears throat> forbidden stories was actually the smallest team uh, in in the oh. so they i think their team of about 12 or 14 people and the way they managed to uh, because their job was just, uh, also to to report and to coordinate no and lead noisy. the investigation really exactly so all the and, and and so many hundreds of like 80 uncontainable journalists which was a yeah. commendable and, thing. so in a sense that this project was also proven that and also that uh, none of the teams had a none of the even the legacy media had huge teams working on this so pretty much the size across organizations which were pe- number of people working on this project was about the same so in a sense this also uh, this project has also proven that uh, maybe size does not matter uh, the number of people <laughs> working uh, so it's possible i don't know great okay so i'm quickly going to take questions i have time for two questions uh, this one is from sayash who says government especially the one in india defends the use of pegasus by stating giving the national security argument how can that argument be countered at any time government wants to suppress any right the reasonable restriction phrase is used by government given that we can't access the list of people that were compromised so how do you counter this we're doing this for national security argument uh, anyone can take that yeah if if you simply look at the people who who we know were hacked um then the national security argument collapses immediately because you're talking about uh journalists you're talking about lawyers activists i mean you, i haven't re- i mean it's such an absurd argument that's used only for national security because we can see on the face of it that it's not um the other point to make which i think is really really important is that this tool is meant to be used for national security purposes and yet me and julian and kabir and sandrine we all managed to get our hands on this list you know we were scrolling through a list of of potentially what contained some of india's most sensitive intelligence secrets like the people who well we've lost you now okay we've lost you completely kabir uh, i'm just going to go to the next question because we're also running out of time and then maybe my just just, just on the you, yeah. you know, just on that point just a very simple uh, answer but how do you know that the how do you make sure that the government follows the rules and doesn't spy on everyone 
And for that, there should be rules and there should be uh, an independent body, maybe uh, whoever looks what the government does. Uh, I mean, the government says something, but why would you trust the government? I mean, we, we, we had a list where hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't face any criminal charges were potential targets. So which means that maybe we should not trust entirely the government. And uh, the use of Pegasus should be, uh, at least should be, uh, you know, there should be guidelines and very precise uh, guidelines. It should not be the jungle because, uh, you know, the our privacy is at stake. So I think it's a very important uh, issue. And I think like uh, Mike pointed out that many of those people, there was just no reason to be uh, targeting them because they, they didn't pose any uh, national security threat in India. You had students, you had protesters, you had journalists. Uh, Kabir, last question for you. And, 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 we don't know how the, and we don't know how the government is using those information. We don't know where those information is actually. Is it uh, someone sitting at the PMO uh, office, at the prime minister's office? Uh, is it an agency? Is it the home ministry? Is it the NSA? I mean, who is using those information and for which purpose? I think they are legitimate questions. Misha, could I make one point now that my, my internet yeah. appears to be working again? Yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just this. No, it's okay. that the very fact of this investigation was that, you know, at some point in time, all of us, all the journalists who are on this list, were sitting in front of a list of possible surveillance targets of the Indian government. Now, if a government was serious about national security, would you be... Would you Uh-oh. <laughs> oh. He was just about to make an important point. But okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll wait for him to come back. Uh, I'm really running out of time. So I'm just going to quickly go to Kabir. Mm -hmm. You hope Michael can just get his uh, internet fixed and just make his points quickly. Kabir, uh, why has there been a lukewarm response to this story among the Indian public? Is it because of COVID second wave? Or are we just lax when it comes to the concept of privacy? Yeah, I, I, I think the second wave was over by then. Um, and I think it goes back to the point that you were making earlier, that the mainstream media's focus was to discredit the story. And it's still the mainstream media which most people access. So the newspapers, the mainstream newspapers and the news channels, uh, their focus was to discredit the story and not to follow up on the story. So like I also mentioned that the, all the stories that we did also need follow-ups, but those follow-ups have not happened. And in a thriving media environment, you would expect that other media would pick up those stories um, and do those and follow those stories. Instead, in India, the focus has been on uh, discrediting, saying that the list is not real, et cetera. So, and, and that's what most of the people follow. So I think that's main, that's the main reason why that has happened. And also, I guess, uh, again, like we were discussing earlier, that privacy concerns in India are different than they are in the West. Mm, so in India, we are used to our aunties and uncles peeping into our lives. So maybe privacy is not really a big issue either. Like our phones are being looked into by the government. Many people would expect that uh, as well. But um, <clears throat> I guess those are the two reasons. But mainly it's the mainstream mm. media, I'm sure, that uh, if the mainstream media had done its job, then the reaction would have been very, very different. And then the story would have, so the, I mean, it's already, the story is already huge, just, just by its very nature, even in this very concocted, very strange media environment that we have in India, uh, the story is still very, very huge. Uh, but it would have been, it would have had a life of its own had it been, uh, had the mainstream media done its job. Mm, I think that's mm. a very important point. Julian, do you just want to come in with uh, how the story is being received in France and since you've also worked in India, just a comparison of the two countries, how, how you think these story played out in France and in India? So, 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 so I think that, uh, I, I think the impact was maybe uh, bigger in India than in France. Uh, for at least one reason is that uh, in India, the political parties, the opposition uh, took up the, the issue. Uh, that issue was taken up in the parliament also. Um, so, so, so in France, the problem is that there was absolutely no accountability from the part of the government. So basically, uh, for example, Macron, who is a potential target 
of Pegasus, because his name was on the list, we still don't know now if his mobile was infected or not. And we just learned yesterday from a leaked report that uh, five ministers uh, had, I mean, they, they, they were like, uh, uh, they, they found traces of Pegasus on their phones. So, so, so yeah, the, the, the problem is that the, the French government did not communicate on it at all. They didn't speak on it. Uh, the only thing that the French government did was to set up a defense council. We asked many questions to the French government and they did not uh, respond. Um, but so, so yes, yeah, so, so I think there was more of an impact in India uh, than in France. Uh, and, and you know, Kabir, when you said that, you know, people in India are used to the fact that maybe their phones are being tapped or, you know, there's more surveillance in India. I think Pegasus also is totally different because you have access to the location of the person, you have access to the contact list, photos and videos. So it's much more than tapping your phone, Pegasus. Yeah. Yeah. But it takes a while to understand. It takes a while for people to understand yeah. that. I mean, it, yeah. just the extent of what Pegasus the Peg Pegasus can do more with your phone than you can. But it takes a while for people mm. to understand that. And I mean, for many people who I called, they told me that you're telling me now I have known since 2001 or 1999. Yes. That I have been, that I have been listening yes. to. So, so many right. people, so because I was trying to understand and many people internalize the fact that maybe now there is no privacy and they got used to it. And maybe that's why they were not shocked to learn about Pegasus. Great. I'll have to wrap this up now. We've already overshot our time. Unfortunately, we lost Michael's audio oh, no, I'm, and video. I'm still oh, here. here. I'm, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> you want to quickly make that point and then I have oh, to Oh, God. It up. You know what? I feel, I feel like I built it up now. I don't know. It, it wasn't even that good a point. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just going to say that, you know, it's the, the guardians of national security who tell us that, that the use of Pegasus is, is legitimate. But for me, the really important point here is that People like, like Julianne, like Kabir, like me, like Sandrine, we were literally scrolling through a list of potential Indian surveillance targets. This is some of the most sensitive information that the Indian government has, and journalists like us got to look at it. And my argument is, if you're serious about national security, why would you outsource something as sensitive as your intelligence capacity to a private company when the risk is it can be exposed to the world. And in my view, a government that is serious about national security, that wants to lecture us about national security, would not be seeking these kinds of shortcuts that result in India's surveillance targets being splashed on the front pages of newspapers across the world. Fair point. And the last thing I wanted to add is, you know, talking about the differences between France and India, uh, in the Pegasus story, India is a unique case in the sense that that's the only democracy which used Pegasus. I mean, the, so, the only so-called uh, democracy that used Pegasus and was victim of Pegasus. Because France, as far as we know, didn't use Pegasus, but was victim of Pegasus. Uh, so, so India... Wow, now we're losing. This is just... <laughs> Misha, can I say, when you want to get a sense of how hard it was to do this investigation, think about how hard it is to make this one hour call work. And, <laughs> and, and, and then some, somehow we managed to communicate with each other for months. Absolutely. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. This is really fabulous. I wish we could do so many things that I'd like to touch on, but we're out of time. Thanks a lot. And uh, because this is a Zoom thing, we had a lot of issues, but hopefully next year we could do this in person and we could have you all guys here in New Delhi and talk about more interesting stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you people who've been with us.